we'll start with a little meditation. And then from there, I'll give a short talk and then open it up for Q&A. So we can all get into a relaxed uh, position, one where we feel alert, but also comfortable. And we can all take 10 deep breaths, breathing in for five seconds and breathing out for 10. Also ask that if anyone um, is unmuted for the meditation and talk, let's just go ahead and mute for those. When you breathe in, discover any tension in the body. And as you breathe out, allow yourself to release any mental or physical tension. As you continue to focus on your breath, I want you to bring to mind a memory, a memory where you felt content, where you felt like nothing in the world needed to be different. Maybe you were with a loved one, family member, or just by yourself. Try to recall the details, where you were, what time of day it was. Try to recall how it felt, what was the experience like to feel content. Begin to breathe in deeply. into that experience. Notice the spaciousness
continue to recall the details. Breathing in to the sense of security, of well being, breathing out any remaining tension that you're carrying. five deep breaths. Into the spaciousness. Now, slowly and gently begin to let go of the memory. Knowing that it will always be there for you and allow just the experience to remain. Breathing in to your inner sense of stability, of belonging, and safety. And take five more deep breaths. with the realization that this is something that you always have access to. That you can always come back to. bring yourself back into the room or your attention back into the room. So. Yes. Reflecting on that experience, um, before I get started, it'd be great to hear maybe two or three comments. Anyone who wants to reflect on their experience of that. Okay, so I just wanted to get a look at everyone that's here. 
just to acknowledge that. And perhaps we can all do the same. Oh yeah, some familiar faces, some people I haven't seen in so long. It's good to see you all. And some new faces that I don't think I've seen before. Okay. So yeah, so now I'll start the talk. Um, and just some background on the talk. So it's really my first time publicly sharing um, in this way. So there is a bit of, um, there is some hesitation, but uh, I think that's a good uncomfortable feeling to be sitting with. So we'll start from there. So what I wanna talk about today is being at home in the world. And to start off, I think it's, it's well enough to start off with what do we mean by home? And so for, for me, when I was thinking about this, what does it mean to be at home with myself? And upon reflecting on this, it's, it has to do with this sense of belonging where you are, the sense of security and safety. And there is a kind of warm temperature to being at home for me. And I think it's, it's quite easy to feel not at home. I think that is probably the more typical experience. And so what does it mean to feel like you're not at home in the world? And that's to feel, feel this, um, this sense of disease. The sense that there's a kind of background neurotic layer of just kind of like, it's okay, it's not great, and there's this sense that you need to grab on to things. And you can see it a lot when you think of um, its subtle ways of showing up is when we are often grasping things. I had a experience in my life where I was listening to like audiobooks nonstop and studying nonstop. And it was quite fun. But I began to notice that there was this subtle um, motivation that was beyond gaining knowledge. It was, I couldn't really stand the silence of just sitting with myself. There's a sense that I needed to do something, the sense that I needed to grab on to something external in order to feel sober. So for me, I kind of started off with my search for home. And this started a long time ago. So I was apparently born in Corpus Christi, Texas. And I say apparently because I don't have any recollection of the place. And it's supposedly on the seaside, which is quite nice to know um, that I was born uh, near seaside. And quickly, probably by the time I was one or two, um, I was orphaned. And then I went into um, foster care. And by the time I was 16, I think I had lived in eight different families, maybe more, maybe a little less. And so the precarity of home for me was, it was, it was much more obvious. But there was kind of, there's kind of two sides of that coin. And the, 
first side is, I mean, I guess it's good to give a little color to the families that I lived with. Um, and, in, and I'll try to explain them in conventional terms, which won't do them the greatest justice. Um, but in the allotted time I have, I guess we'll have to um, go forward with that. So I've lived in families where getting a 39 cents cheeseburger on Wednesday nights was expensive. It's a very poor families. And I've also lived with very rich families where smuggling in two monkeys um, from Nevada that cost a fortune back to California was kind of fun, what they would call fun. So I've also lived in quite extravagant um, families. And across all those, they are also what you would call different culturally. So I have lived in a um, traditionally speaking, in a Filipino family. I've lived in a Mexican family. I've lived in a, um, a uh, African-American family, a white family, a British, Irish family. I'm trying to see if I'm forgetting any. An Indian family from India. And on the surface, the, I say that because um, we often think that that is a way to find differences. And so, of course, in one family, picking up a fork and eating was perfectly appropriate. And in another family, eating with your hands was appropriate. And then if I went back and used my hands in one family, that was seen as barbaric. And using a fork was seen as pretentious. And so I was a really confused little, I guess I could say boy. I don't even know if I identify it that much as a boy even. And so I went through each of these families living with them. And I started to, so for me, I should say this um, because I think it, add some good colors that I never really um, thought of. So I could, I could do it in comparison. So there was other kids that were living there, some biological, some foster, who suffered much more than I did. And so I want to make it clear that I, I think I am a very lucky person. And a lot of times their suffering stem from this distinction between the real family and the, the fake family or the temporary family. And seeing that when they were living in the family with me that wasn't their biological family, they felt like they needed to get out of there as soon as possible. But I never felt that sense of needing to go back to um, the real family. And I didn't have a sense that there was such a thing as a real family. And in certain ways that might be saddening, but I actually felt like it saved me from a lot of suffering that I saw in these other children. And so as I watched them suffer from having this belief that this these parents, these new parents, were not good enough. That there was something greater that they needed to get back to this authentic, real place. I think I started to see at a very young age at how these ideas were parasitic. They could be parasitic. They could also be very helpful and and so at a young age, I think I quickly began to adopt whatever. So on, on the test that I would take, I would sign my 
um, sometimes gender changes, mostly racial changes, whatever race the family was. And so I felt, I, I felt very loose in my identity. And because of this, I had the opportunity to really begin to look for my true home. And then to be able to realize that my true home is not limited to any one family or to any one location, race, sex, to any identity that we usually identify with and find belonging with. I, I was able to see at a young age that there was something greater that I could feel at home in the world no matter what family I was in and I could adopt whatever it is that their values were and begin to see that within myself there was what I first thought were contradictions because I came from a uh, this British family and they talked this way and then I went to this other family where that way of talking was and I felt like constantly like a con like I was contradicting myself. And then eventually, once that breakthrough started to happen, I started to see that I could not claim any of these identities. I could not claim that I am British, that I am white, that I am black, that I am Mexican, that I am Filipino, and it it is more of the case that I am all of these things, that within me, that I contain multitudes, and that I could see that that was the only way for me to not contradict myself, to see that in myself. And so what I discovered was the kind of the art of non-discrimination and not in the social activist sense, more so in the sense of living uh, in order to be at home in the world, you must um, practice the art of non-discrimination. And the way to do that is to begin to look at things at a much deeper level than we usually do. And so, just giving a working definition of non-discrimination. It meant that when I, when I moved to China for a project and was able to live um, in between with my partner and her parents, that the distinction between Chinese and American was basically not there for me that I could easily connect with these people who maybe they themselves saw me as an American uh, initially were quickly able to see that we were connected in the same way that their next door neighbors would be. And so for me, it's not really about the other person reaching this because we can't expect that. But when we act out of this place of non-discrimination, and what I mean is utterly no discrimination, in seeing that the contradictions, when I spoke with certain families, they would say, well, we're a Mexican family. This is what Mexicans do. And then I'd see contradictions, and they say, and of course, the white people are like this, and then I'd say, well, I lived with them and that wasn't the case for all of them. And there would just continue to be these contradictions. And when you really look inside the complexity of what it means to be human, you arrive at non-discrimination. It doesn't mean that people aren't different. They surely are. They're just not different in the um, very clean ways we like to describe them in culture. Um, in fact, if you go into a family that's um, Mexican and, and one that's black, let's say, you're going to find as much differences between the people and the family 
as you will, between the groups. And that's something I discovered um, quite directly. So the root of all this is non-discrimination. And in order to do that, I think that's the, the question is how do you not discriminate if I want to be at home in the world? That means there, there cannot be this large distinction between myself and the other. Because if I go to China and I see the image, I create this image in my head of myself, who I am, and it's this professional person, data scientist, American person, and I see that that's me. And then I create another image of the Chinese person, and I use that as a way to compare myself, as a way to say that I can't be at home in the world because they're just not like me. And so this is a very limited view to not see that they themselves contain multitudes and contain the suffering, a lot of the suffering that you've been through and a lot of the joy. And so in practicing this, you have to first give up the idea that you are this um, solid sense of self. And you already know this because you are constantly contradicting yourself, likely. If you're not, then you have a really good um, uh, defensive uh, complex going on. But typically, we live in contradiction. We say, we want to be this way. I'm going to wake up early tomorrow. And then we don't. And then you know, there's all sorts of these contradictions. All you have to do is look inwards and see that they're always there. And they're not actually contradictions. It, they're only contradictions against the background of discrimination. You can discriminate against yourself by saying, I should be like this. But you're currently, at least for the moment, not. And so now you've discriminated by creating this better self versus current self, and now there's conflict. And we do this all the time. And so moving towards non-discrimination, it doesn't mean that we don't see differences. I also want to make that clear. We, we are uniquely different in some interesting ways. It's just that we are mostly the same. Uh, and so what does it take for us to see a bird outside and see that as, as close as family as we would a person that we've known for 20 years? And of course, this is an aspiration. But when we can do that, imagine how at home in the world you would actually be, where you can, wherever you are, look to the things around you and fill your connection with them. And that's really the basis of non-discrimination. And so the next thing I'll do is if you can bring up something in your room, in your place, just a simple thing, I'm going to bring up this plant. And you can bring up anything. It, it doesn't have to be an organic it could be a piece of wood. And I wanted to teach something that the Zen teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, teaches. And it's called interbeing. And it says, basically, if you look at the plant, at the most shallow level, you see the forms. You see the colors, the texture. And that's the plant. But when you look deeply, and to the plant, just in this simple plant, you can see, you can see the sun, you can see clouds, you can see people, you can see that this plant is actually made up of nothing but non-plant elements. 
I'm really try to take that in. This plant is made up of nothing but non-plant elements. And if we keep going back to the root, to the seed, and we go back even further to where there were no plants, we end up seeing that there's only one root, right? That, that this, that actually in this plant, the whole cosmos exists. And it's not in a, this is not in a, and I guess I'm, what I'm trying to say is like, it's, it's not, I'm not just saying this in a artsy way, but I'm saying actually the plant is made up of scientifically nothing but non-plant elements. And if you look at your face, and if you really try to think deeply looking at your face and try to pull it back all the way to the point where maybe in the Big Bang, it was scattered across as minerals, or as rocks. And that your current formation is a temporary formation that when you so-called die, um, you become figments, and eventually that forms into something else. So in a sense, the garbage, which we call compost, is the flower. So within this flower, I can see the garbage. And so everything is, is within it. And it means I cannot draw a line between myself and the plant when I look deeply. So that is interbeing. And so that means that to be American is to be made up of non-American elements. That means to be white is to be made up of non-white races. And you can continue to break it down. Now, what this does is it can be somewhat overwhelming because you cannot distinguish the bad guy from the good guy. Because within the bad guy, the good guy has to exist. And so we cannot make these harsh distinctions between the other. And now we can notice that these distinctions only exist in the shallow realm of seeing. But we can train ourselves to actually see from this deeper perspective. And so you may look at me and see an American or an Indian or a African American or a British person, but I can assure you that I am made up of everything but those elements. And it's not a denial of those things. It's to say that if what you mean by that is to create a distinction between yourself and I, then it cannot be true. And it's a temporary illusion. And so that's interbeing, seeing that within a flower, within a plant, we can see the whole cosmos. And so to kind of end on the interbeing note, I want to read part of the poem by Thich Nhat Hanh. And it's called, Call Me, Please Call Me By My True Names. Do not say that I'll depart tomorrow because even today I still arrive. Look deeply, I arrive in every second to be a bud on a spring branch, to be a tiny bird with wings still fragile, learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower, to be a jewel hiding itself in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and to cry, in order to fear and to hope. The rhythm of my heart 
is the birth and death of all that are alive. I am the mayfly metamorphosing on the surface of the river. I am the bird which when spring comes arrives in time to eat the mayfly. I am the frog swimming happily in the clear pond. I am also the grass snake who approaches in silence and feeds itself on the frog. I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks. I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am the 12 year old girl, refugee on a small boat who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate. And I am the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. I am a member of the drug lords with plenty of power in my hands. I am the man who has to pay his debt of blood to my people, dying slowly in a forced labor camp. My joy is like spring, so warm it makes flowers bloom in all walks of life. My pain is like a river of tears, so full it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true names, so I can hear all my cries and, lie and laughs at once, so I can see that my joy and my pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up and so the door of my heart can be left open, the door of compassion. So I'll just pause there. Um, I didn't get through what I wanted to, but I actually feel this. I'm content with leaving it here. And so I leave, I want to leave um, time for questions. And I want to just conclude with that. In this talk, I hope that I could convey to you that you contain multitudes and that you are if you feel yourself as a contradiction that's quite natural because you are you contain multitudes and that being at home in the world requires you to see that you are utterly unconditionally connected to everything and that means that you may have to give up taking strong sides where you see a bad guy that isn't filled with good or a good guy who isn't filled with bad and if you can come to do that in your by way of mindfulness by looking deeply by being mindful of what arises then you can come home and it will always be with you wherever you go so thank you guys. Thank you, Christian. So I want to open it up for Q and A. Not sure exactly how to do this, but yeah. Well, I guess I'll jump in. Thank you, Christian. Um, I guess the poem at the end and, and the containing multitudes has me thinking about what I said toward the beginning about the contentment. Because I feel like any time that I would say are probably the happiest times, I'm also acutely aware of how, how temporary they are. I'm also aware of how fragile it is. So it's like I'm also, it's also painful. It's the bittersweetness of, uh, of the situation. And in the poem, you, that you selected it talked about um, the, the cries and the laughter all at once. Yes. So I wonder if uh, you, 
in the good and the bad people embodying both. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about contentment. Like you're content with this yeah. talk, even though you acknowledged that it wasn't what you thought it would be. So there's that probably letting go of that. So could you right. flesh that out? Sure, sure. I think, um, yeah, so I think one part I was going to talk about was pleasure and pain. And we're often caught up in um, a kind of game of trying to bat away the pain and, and pursue pleasure. And that tends to be what makes things worse is because we don't accept that, as the poem was saying, is that the crying and the laughter are requirements. It's almost like the caterpillar quote that I left there. You have to be the caterpillar for some time before you become the butterfly. So I think in terms of contentment, it's it's really something we have to practice because we already we we already are content and i don't think we know that and i think you can discover this when you're at home and you're just having a moment and and nothing it, it may not be 5 minutes or 10 minutes or 30 minutes of contentment but you likely have flashes where you don't need to change anything and it's about really thinking, not thinking, but um, what I would say, being mindful about those moments, being aware that you were content, rather than um, the belief that I'm always discontent, I'm always dissatisfied, because it isn't. Um, yeah, so that would be, um, and it's a practice. It's not something we, we're undoing, the undoing project in a way. I hope that was helpful, Katie. Hi, Christian. Hi. Hi, this is Yao from Shanghai. Thank you for such a beautiful session. Uh, I don't know yet how to articulate my question clearly, but um, uh, I think I met you very briefly when you were in Shanghai doing the project. So that was a very uh, different, maybe, aspect of you. And here you are <laughs> coming across as almost like a spiritual master, if I may use a word. So, so my question is, how, um, how does that kind of awareness of, or Zen awareness um, has changed or shifted your day-to-day -day life? Yeah. That's a good question. Nice hearing from you, y'all. Um, yeah. Well, we can think of, uh, there's multiple ways to think of uh, Zen meditation or meditation in general. I like to think of it as non-discrimination. So what you're doing is, for however long you're doing it, you're sitting there and you want to allow want to allow any thought, sensation, feeling, whatever it is that's arising in consciousness, you don't want to act on it. You want to acknowledge it and let it pass. And when you do that practice, what we're so used to doing is a feeling arises. So fear arises and I instantly act on it. If there's a mosquito, um, I just had this experience where there's this mosquito while I was meditating and I had this urge come up where I wanted to um, literally kill the mosquito, which is saddens me a bit. And of course, because I've been meditating, I know that I can't actually act on that. And so the mosquitoes there lands on, lands on my face and I, we actually have an exchange. I'm giving it the gift of my blood and it's giving me this gift of fearlessness to be able to begin to cultivate that. And so I think that's the practice is non-discrimination. And what does that mean in a practical sense? It means that we're often getting hooked by habitual patterns. So someone comes up to us, says something, and if it's in the right way, we'll get activated. 
and we'll respond in a certain way, we'll be defensive. And what this practice does is because you've learned to take all phenomena that comes to you and to allow it to pass and not act on it, is it gives you a choice. And you begin to get a gap between the feeling or the sensation or the thought and action. Instead of being a kind of controlled by that feeling. So here comes anger. I instantly react. So instead what you get is you get anger and it's kind of funny. It becomes kind of interesting. Oh, look, anger. Hello. You almost invited in. Come on, anger. I've seen you before. And you're actually able to sit with that because of your practice. And then you can decide because sometimes anger is a great signal for something. So you can then decide, okay, well, I am being stepped on in this situation. So here's what I should do as, as good action. Or maybe I actually overthought it. Um, or I, I, I was wrong about, uh, I shouldn't be angry. It's actually based on a false dichotomy. So it gives you that gap between um, feelings or, or, and thoughts and action. Is that helpful? Oh, I want to add a little more to that as it has to do with me, because you did bring up that change between Shanghai me and, and now. Again, I contain multitudes, that's, that's why. <laughs> but um, to, to add some color to that, um, I used to be very, very aggressive. I'm still quite aggressive, actually meaning in terms of productivity, like there's pretty much, it's at one point, I don't think anyone um, could spend more time than I did on making sure my calendar was insanely filled. And I always had this, this want to act, this want to do, am I doing something? Am I a value? Am I a value? I didn't know I was asking that question but I was asking that question. Once I started doing mindfulness, I realized, oh, every time I do this, I'm actually feeling like I'm not a value anymore and I need to make up for it. So what can I do? I should take no moments off, no time off. I never take a weekend, anything like that. And it's not from a source of, oh, powerful Christian being productive. It's actually from a place of, yeah, a place of harshness, a place of not accepting myself. And so this practice has helped me realize that, oh, you can actually be both. You, you don't have to totally give up productivity, but you want to give up the root, the bad roots of, of why you're doing it that way. So I think that has been the biggest change. Thank you, Yao. Um, Christian, I have a question. How has um how has COVID like uniquely like called on all of the things that you've learned? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah. So I think I've, I've um, Margot and I have led a tr like so many more meditations through <laughs> through COVID um, to support the community. So that was really the first like uh, natural response to it. Um, to be honest, well, I think we all experienced it very differently, and I experienced it as. Um, as, as my turn to help wherever I could, because I'm not, I'm privileged to not be affected, meaning I didn't lose my job or I didn't get COVID or, or know anyone with it. And so how can we support people? And especially like so many people are now going inwards on their own. And so I've been 
trying to be there for people with that and also um, engage more deeply in my practice. Um, I think I think one particular way, because I have um, my parents, who I call my parents in, in China, have been struggling with the situation and um, I have been particularly invested in helping them get through this and also not worry about Americans, <laughs> which they're like, these Americans are sure like not handling things the right way. So they're quite worried about it. So I've been helping them um, understand the nuance of that. Yeah. So it hasn't changed much, but I think my level of Um, action and and being there trying to be there and present for people I think that's ultimately the only thing I really have to offer <laughs> is like presence and if you can give unconditional presence I don't have a vaccine I don't I don't have lots of the things that people um, would need and so I think I've had um a great time um, providing presence for people. And I hope I've been okay at doing that. Thank you, Deidre. We probably have room for one final question. Was there something in particular, Kristen, that started you on this journey? Yeah, um, I will say it, it's, there's a sudden and gradual, and I think the gradual has been probably the more important. Um, when I was in China, I had already started visiting temples. So before I moved into the Zen Center in San Francisco, I was somehow um interested i because i started meditating like in 2013 or something but it was very casual but my real commitment to it really started um when i was in china um yeah and i think i think there was just the right formation of life events happening with my partner with myself with like thinking about helping and being a part of this family in China and, and possibly even moving there and and yeah just seeing the limits of I mean the experiments that I've had with productivity have also been helpful in helping me see that that is probably not the right way um, yeah so it's 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 been a gradual and then there's the sudden stuff so yeah. Okay. So let's spend the last 15 seconds or so just. Um, oh, sorry, Francesco. I don't know if you would do something there. But let's just um, ground ourselves before we leave. Just take maybe four or five deep breaths. You don't have to try to achieve anything. Just breathing. Thank you, guys.
Thank you all. Thanks, Christian. Christian. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Christian. Bye, Christian. Bye. Good to see you. Good to see you guys.